Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here to break down some of the news that you might have missed and share my thoughts on the things that are going on in the scene. Um, obviously, things are moving while all of the teams that are at the Messiah are preparing for a Messiah and we're excited for a Messiah. A lot of things are happening uh, behind the scenes. I, you know, am chronically online, so I'll help you if you missed anything. Uh, let me know uh, in the comments below what you think. Uh, I want to also add in the pipeline, I had an episode. With voice of Imaro with shocks, but for some reason the audio was fucked. So it's just me talking and her being mute. It was a lovely conversation, lovely episode, and uh, I can't post it sadly. So that kind of stings. But uh, I, we are going to re-record something at some point in time when it makes sense. Uh, additionally, you know I have um, the tier list video coming up in the pipeline. You know top five players in each position at MSI and maybe a top 10 list because, you know, there's not a lot of players at MSI. And then uh, additionally, a little lane swap breakdown video so you know what to expect and you can be like that uh, Leo meme where you like points like, hey, hey, I, I know that, you know? So you can be cool in your Discord channel and say, yo, this, this, this person should have based here and they should have warded here. <laughs> you can be smug and you're your friends can just begin to hate you slowly because you just come across as a smart ass. If that's what you want, then watch the video. All right, sources. Riot plans to host a third LOL international tournament in 2025. So this is something that Monty uh, already mentioned last year. Uh, I think, um, you know, another international tournament. Uh, the tournament is set to take place between winter and spring, so very con convenient for the LEC, of course, the LEC or the three split system. I don't like it too much, but it is what it is. The LCS also moving towards a three split system makes a lot of sense because they want to play single round robin best of threes. And also there are only eight teams in the league. So I think on, on that level, it makes, of course, a lot of sense over there. I think it makes a lot less sense for the LPL and the LCK to move to a third, three split system. Uh, the LPL has 17 teams. We shouldn't look to dilute the format. The same thing for the LCK. I think all of us have kind of gotten used to, to a double round robin uh, best of three because this is just a very, very good format to determine who is truly, you know, the best team in the region. You know, in terms of the competitive aspect, you know, usually you can easily predict how the standing is going to look like in the LCK. And the beauty of that is because the format is very competitively honest. And I think that the LCK, I think the fans of it are not going to be happy if we're robbed of that uh, precision and that fairness in what the format is. So I'm having this conversation because the discourse online is all about, oh, everything's going to move into the three split system. I don't think so. I think there is ways to seed yourself into a potential international tournament that happens in between. I think you can make adjustments for the schedule, kind of a courtesy period for the teams that are going to play at the international tournament. It's like, oh, maybe they're not going to play right away in the week that they play and they're going to move and schedule the matches a little bit later. This is something that's been done. This is something that happens frequently in the LPL when there's like visa things and things being figured out. And then sometimes, you know, games become backloaded for a specific team. There's a lot of logistics involved because they play at arenas and so forth. So this is something that can be done. There's also a break, for, for example, the, the Lunar New Year. Seeding is a big question, right, for the LCK. I think that it can be done that you play one round robin and then whoever wins that round robin is going to just seed themselves into this tournament. That would be fair and square, you know, boom. And the LPL is a little bit harder, right, because in terms of the seeding, you have a situation where 17 teams, maybe in the new format, there's a way to, to adapt to that. Maybe you involve the Asia Cup or Kespa Cup. It's also not super, super fair and honest because in December, some rosters are not completely finished, right? Sometimes subs play and so forth. But I think there is a way to, to figure this out without breaking down the spring and summer split system over in Asia. There was an example of SK, for example, back in 2015, I believe in summer, they qualified to an IEM because if I remember correctly, they were eight and zero in the regular split. They were eight and zero and they qualified to this IEM. It was funny because they went to that IEM and I believe Rocks, I think they were called Rocks at the time, maybe Ku Tigers, maybe Ku Tigers, Rocks or Ku Tigers, the homies, they basically banned all Forgiven's AD carries. You know, the Caitlyn, I believe Lucian, Graves, 
And all of a sudden, SK came back from that tournament after being kind of figured out and everyone applied the same strategy and they kind of lost a bit of steam and gas because they were full on, you know, play for forgiven gray, dash forward no matter what, jungle needs to be here, back me up because I need to dash forward type gameplay. Nevertheless, a little uh, short story for you in the background. I'm happy that more tournaments are taking place. It's going to be a very busy schedule for the top end teams, right? Getting a Grand Slam, a Golden Road is going to be close to impossible. The Golden Road, of course, is winning all the like all competitions that you're participating in in a calendar. When it comes to G2, as an example, 2019, they were very close. They won LEC, they won MSI, they won LEC, and then boom, lost finals against FPX. There was T1 2015 that was very close. They just lost MSI. Game 5 against EDG, boom, the famous Leblanc game. You know, people talk about Morgana being a counter to Leblanc, but mate, you're putting Leblanc together with Nunu Jungle Blood. Uh, nevertheless, I bet people mind that game. Okay, we continue. I'm excited about this. I hope the formats for the LCK and the LPL don't get headshot for this. Uh, for LCS and L LEC, I think it makes uh, some sense. An additional layer of this, right, is uh, I would be worried that uh, this kind of confirms that there won't be, you know, any changes in terms of the roadshows. It's like the LCS and the LEC, I guess they've determined that it's not financially good to do roadshows. So this is going to be the equivalent of that where they involve all the big dogs that bring in the most amount of eyeballs. As you can see, of course, T1 is the most interesting team to watch. and The Chinese teams also bring in the numbers. So letting Europe and North America taste that rainbow a little bit more uh, will be good <laughs> for those regions. But that's it. Uh, we jump into it. I guess the last thing I can add is GBs was received the following response from a spokesperson. We plan to have an update on the 2025 Lolly Esports schedule in June. So June. This year, June. Not in June. All right. Next piece of news. Another, another one from Sheep Esports. The homies. Uh, I didn't ask for permission for this, so let me know if you don't like it. But shout out to Sheep Esports for this lovely graphic. LPO. Changing the format for summer. They are implementing Fearless Draft. A round one, double round robin. So it means that teams are going to be playing six games, six games, six games, and then here eight because there's five teams, uneven numbers in the LPL, 17 teams. Yet in this moment, top two teams to upper bracket, the upper bracket, this one, and the lower bracket, this one. So basically, double round robin, best of threes, top two go further, bottom two go further, but they are in the lower bracket and they risk elimination. The key thing here, of course, is Fearless Draft. That's what everybody's talking about, Fearless Draft. Fearless Draft, for those who don't know, it's basically a drafting system where if you pick a champion once, you're not allowed to pick it again. But of course, the enemy team don't have the same restriction on that particular champ. So if you play Garen in game one, the enemy team can play Garen in game two. And what does this promote, right? This pr promotes strategy because... Uh, if you know that the enemy can't pick a specific champ, you can ban three champs, you can set up for that champion on red side to pick it on one, two, false bans from red side. Uh, there is ways to target players in terms of their pool. There is um, strategies to maybe set up champions that are less common and it pushes players to go deeper and deeper into their champion pool. So the odds are we're going to see a lot more variance and variety in terms of what teams actually draft so it really rewards creativity but at the cost of precision you know uh, like i think for for a lot of us we enjoy watching players perform at the highest level and you know in that moment in time it's like wow this guy is the best at azir like chovi azir in this playoffs was immaculate if he's playing a fearless format and needs to be a little bit more all over the place i'm sure he'll do fine maybe we'll have less of those wow moments like for example night on syndra or um shanji on rumble or um you know you get you get to just right? been on jacks but i think it's cool that it's in the format the fearless draft occurs in the portion that doesn't have any elimination so of course you can put yourself in a much better position because being in the winner bracket where you get to play eight best of threes 
and here seven of course because it's a single round robin with regular draft here it becomes very easy to qualify to playoffs right getting top seven out of nine is something that should be doable right and then the bottom two get the chance to play against some of the lower end teams in a bo5 to qualify for playoffs so there's going to be less games for most teams here right less games but uh, the playoff system i believe remains the same where we have the dual gauntlets that then you know merges together in a double elimination system and the top you know uh, the seeding would be based off of course who wins in the winner bracket and goes in top seven and then the seeding is in you know in order here uh, in regards to uh, these matches here of course there should be eight nine and ten so there's that i think this is super cool i think it's very interesting the main thing that has been talked about is that you know there was in the rumors when this came out is that they are rolling out a format that is going to be seen in other regions so basically they're rolling out this format here in summer and maybe this is something that ties into of course that international tournament maybe that international tournament that we will see between winter and spring is going to be a fearless draft tournament you know maybe that is their way of making it stand out against msi because it would be i would enjoy it but maybe there's a sense of boredom that comes with msi into msi into world championship and this could be a way of making that tournament more dynamic so it's interesting i'm excited for this i'm worried that there's matchups that we maybe won't see due to this and the repetition of some matchups here is going to be a little bit boring it's kind of fun to watch your favorite teams play against a different team all the time all right if these gr groups are very uneven in terms of power and you get to see like Billy Billy just fucking smack everybody around because they are like number one seed. Like the groups are going to be based off seeding of of of, uh, of uh, the placements in spring. If we would just see Billy Billy like club, you know, it's like JDG is just clubbing everyone, and we don't get to see JDG versus Top Esports, so we don't get to see like basically the top four teams play against each other for a solid amount of time. You know, maybe just maybe that is going to you know hurt the product. You know. Uh, like those are the big games and we're not going to have big games for quite some time so that part of it i really don't like you know that part of it i really really don't like and then finally when they get into the winner bracket they get to play against each other one time this portion is going to be giga giga fun you know giga giga fun nine teams the best of the best play off against each other for single round robin that's cool you know single that's basically a continuation of what we saw in previous splits but with just completely loaded up on you know banger games but as I mentioned before you know in China there's a lot of OTPs a lot of crazy players that have like you know pocket picks that is going to make it wild the lower end teams have opportunities to create upsets in the fearless draft format naturally right Fearless draft brings variance, brings opportunities that can maybe only work once. And this is the moment to execute on those dream coach ideas that you have with the players, you know, and so forth. Here, this is the moment to pull off strategies that should only work once. So basically, like you set up some cheese with triple bands and you have some secret counter that goes, that only works if like eight champions are out of the pool, something like this, right? Uh, this is the moment for teams to cause upsets. The reason I mention it is because maybe we're going to go through this whole format without having certain matchups that we want to see up until playoffs. And that hurts my soul a little bit. That really, really hurts my soul. But we'll have to see how, how this pans out because in the way the LPL teams, you know, the bottom end teams, you know, I think uh, something that I want to add to this discussion, often... In regards to this course, this is also often like the main criticism towards me. It's like, I haven't won a DLC championship. I've been in finals a couple of times, I qualified to world a couple of times. But often it's like success is only measured by winning or not winning. But in the LPL, you clearly have teams that are working with less of a budget. They're working with uh, less of that 
just financial power really and that that pool uh, that maybe a billy billy has or like a weibo gaming has you know it's like you see from the side of rng and edg these are historic organizations that are now going through the ringer financially and they're having you know a lot of pain points it's like success needs to be measured by did you achieve underachieve did you achieve what would you expected or did you overachieve base of the resources in contrast to the rest of the league right so i think a lot of these teams here that are on the lower end in the lpl they have a lot of pride in what they are doing a lot of pride in what they are doing and they're going to come out swinging here in the fearless draft so i'll have to see how this pans out but on first hand glance i think that the fearless portion of the draft is what is going to carry the excitement here because we're not going to see banger matchups we're not going to have the monster matchups and we'll just have to see how these groups uh, shape up there's that and now we move on to the off-season portion of this discussion tarzan tarzan heading out to weibo gaming very very likely this is a rumor tarzan is someone that has dominated the ladder you know it's it's crazy how you know some players that might not do well in like the last game that they played, you know, that series against T1 was very rough for Tarzan and Scout. And then all of a sudden, roster changes occurred and Tarzan was sitting out. But the same way Trimby in Europe, I feel like Tarzan was a player that had, would receive opportunities in the LCK or in the LPL eventually. And now he's joining Weibo Gaming. So that's the roster with, of course, you have um, Zhaohu and you have, of course, Crisp and Light and the additional addition of breathe so breathe is a player that is fantastically good you know he struggled here on uh, of course um, rng rng are getting rid of their players i guess they need money of course breathe is a very very strong player but he is definitely in the pool of players that got nerfed with the divine thunder changes breathe was a fiora enjoyer jacks enjoyer he likes the carries but in this split most recently he played the jace too very mechanically talented player you know i think this way gaming roster is quite strong I think ZDZ was a solid player, but Breathe is a little bit more established and uh, a little bit more solid. I think the ZDZ had uh, high up games, but also very low lows, especially in the last few five that they played. So Tarzan in, and of course Breathe in. I think this is straight up upgrades here for Weibo Gaming. I think the big one is just Jungle. We'll have to see how Tarzan interacts without Scout. Uh, so very exciting to see Tarzan back. That is the rumor currently. And next big rumor is the Shy. So the Shy, for those who don't know, it's like one of the most famous players, one of the most beloved players, most most famous players in terms of streaming numbers and so forth. He is very very loved over in in China and also in Korea and also of course in the West. We have we have Kedro pretty much, you know, fellatioing him uh, on cooldown. You know, the shy has had a wonderful world championship and they decided to sit out and now he's coming back to lng so zika is not is not a weak player right i think zika is solid i think they had a strong last year and to replace him maybe feels you know bad in some shape or form but the reason i mentioned you know the weight that the shy carries you know it's very very high highs he has like this lax attitude in terms of his gameplay like he has a floor where basically his floor is limbo dancing with the devil, you know, like the, like in hell, you know, that's his floor, but his ceiling is up in the heavens, you know? So very exciting play to watch in terms of the gravity that a team, <laughs> uh, like the eyeballs that a team is going to have based on just pulling, putting him in, the plain and simple, you know, gain and reward here is, is massive. But I think the Shy as a player showed a very, very high high last year. He basically put Bin in the dirt right, and Bin is a legendary player. And the Shy had a fantastic world championship. Let's see what kind of a the Shy we will see on LNG. So that, uh, of course, uh, the roster then is Gala. We have uh, Hang. We have um, Scout, and then Weiwei, and then Tarzan. So of course, uh, not Tarzan. Sorry, the Shy. So. They have room for uh, another import and that's going to be the shy no clue what's going to happen to, to zika i think this is a player that uh, deserves to play now we move on to north america we have licorice 
Licorice, licorice, licorice. So the last time we saw him play was against BDS, where he got smoked. Uh, it is sad that a player gets judged for the last series. I think Licorice had an insane come up. Last year during spring, I thought he was awful. Awful, awful, awful. And then they made a demon run. They started fucking playing well and they started winning and Goldia Guardian started cracking heads. And I think a big part of that was Licorice starting to play better. So he's going to be joining Dignitas, that is the rumor. And uh, of course, Dignitas, they had uh, Rich, the uh, Heroes of the Storm Goat, and Licorice is going to be subbed in. I think it makes sense for Dignitas' position to make some changes. And Licorice is a player that uh, should not be on the bench over North America. I think he's a very solid player, very well rounded player. And I hope that he comes in with good form. You know, this is a player that has been busy for quite some time. It is his debut, of course, on uh, C9. And uh, I think that, um, you know, it's a very, very solid player. So I'm happy that he gets to join. And uh, next one in line for North America, Thanatos. You know, big a lot of discourse surrounding Thanatos. Like there was, you know, rumors that he was going to join KC. You know, from, from a... Career standpoint, I do think it makes a lot more sense in, of course, the short term for Thanatos and also the long term for Thanatos to join C9. So I think KC is an organization with a lot of fans and so forth, but if you come over as an import and your opening, you know, games are going to be losing games, sometimes it doesn't matter how well you play. You're going to be a victim of your circumstance. And C9 having history, working with Korean players, bringing in Bre uh, uh, Reaper as well to supply help for someone like Thanatos, Reaper, uh, you know, as, as just a very, very good reputation in my mind in terms of integrating players. I think that as a career move, it just makes perfect sense for Thanatos to go over there. I think that he will be nurtured there and he has all of the tools to, to set himself up uh, for success, because he needs to think about his long term. Like if his opening split on KC, when they are pretty much going through a rebuild, is going to be bad, uh, that can hurt future prospects for Thanatos, because this is a player that is very, very hyped due to his uh, CL performances. This guy has been finals MVP, I believe, twice. I think we have it right here, right? All CL team back in 2023. Uh, in summer, you have a finals MVP in spring, and then you have finals MVP in 2022 spring. And Kespa Cup, oh, I'm clicking stuff, I want to go back. So Thanatos is a very, very high player, makes sense for him to go to C9. C9, I think they needed to make a change uh, in the top lane position, I think it makes sense. Uh, there was a rumor that Wunder was someone that they approached, I think Wunder would have made a lot of sense for C9 too. I think the main issue that C9 have always wrestled with is I think that their identity be became so diluted because they thought too highly of themselves. This might sound weird because I'm just kind of reading it from outside, but it seems like they never commit to an identity. And I think there's no shame in that because winners, the big winners always commit to identities. You think about JDG and T1 last year, these were the two best teams, right? And they had a very, very clear identity. They, they specialized in certain things, and that made them the most dangerous. I still believe to this day, if they rallied around their strongest players and they have had, had more role players on the team, I think it would have made a lot more sense. And the key thing here and the question is, can C9 then shape a new identity here with Thanatos and Berserker? Can they create a circumstance where everything makes sense because you need to have role players on teams? that do the dirty work. It's like I mentioned JDG, it's like you had 369, he did so much dirty work, missing always picked engaged champions, it's like missing and 369, what a fucking uh, duo they were in terms of creating space for their carries, Kanavi was involved too. And the same thing for, of course, T1, with Faker and Owner uh, just doing the dirty work for the team, right? That's what C9, I feel like, uh, are lacking. Let's see if Thanatos and Reaper being added is going to be just that, because I feel like C9 always romanticized how good they actually are, and they tried to play everything and carry through everywhere. And uh, they, they went a little bit too deep in the rabbit hole. It's like as if they prepared themselves for fearless drafts. So I'm excited for the changeup for C9. On the flip side, I want to say that Mithy is a person that should go onto a team, you know? He's a very, very brilliant mind for the game. I worked with him in the past, and I know him. 
Uh, I haven't talked to him too much lately. I wanted to work together with him in Fnatic, but I think that um, you know this is a person that belongs on a team. So I'm sure that when Mithy is ready, teams will also be ready to receive him. So that's North America. Uh, let's move on to the next step. We will jump with closer maybe uh, to to this segment. Uh, Giant X. So Giant X. When one chapter ends, another one begins. Let's roll the clip. Who that boy? Who him is? <laughs> the Antonio. So, the Antonio getting into the mix. A very surprising move. I guess it's like I mentioned it on the, the shy portion. The Antonio is very loved, right? It's like Giants, it's probably the worst name you could possibly have. Not because it's a bad name, but if you Google Giants, you're probably gonna get the sports team. Like if you write Giants here, it's like uh, like uh, New York Giants comes first. It's like Giant X. It's like it's a terrible name because it's not unique. It's a good name, but it's not unique. But they are making a power move here by slotting in the Antonio. I'm going to be honest, I don't think he's good. <laughs> I don't think he's good. He's a tank player. He's, he's got this Choga. He's a tank player, tank enjoyer, weak side player. But I just don't think he's good. I don't think he's an upgrade over Odo Amne. But the Antonio is a guy that is going to, you know, be a role player. He's going to sacrifice. He's not going to fucking pick Jace in the deciding game. So maybe there's that. Maybe there's that. In terms of from Giants' perspective, this is a player that they already had on payroll, right? They are already on payroll. And also this is a player that just brings, you know, a lot of excitement in terms of what the fan interaction is. So in terms of a business move, in terms of building hype for the team, this is something that makes sense. It does make sense. But in terms of the competitive aspect, I'm not a believer. <laughs> I'm not a believer at all. Uh, he would have to show me something new. Uh, I haven't watched too much of him recently, but I, I remember, I, I, I can't imagine what kind of shape up uh, he could have had that would make me think that he's good. I think that most top laners are going to have a field day. They're going to farm off of him. And um, the question is if, um, you know, his, his tank wall can can survive long enough for the players around them to carry. But I think in terms of the business move, you know, the chatter and, and, the, and, and the clicks and the interactions, I think this is, you know, uh, like in terms of money, it's a fine move. In terms of competition, I don't like it. I think, you know, it is what it is. You know? We shall see. We shall see. Uh, additionally, what is rumored is that uh, Juhan, world champion, the Eric sub, he played the, a little Maokai game there, uh, sub for Piyoshi. You know, I'll admit, I didn't watch Giant X play. So if they surprised me, I'll eat my words. I said always when we were watching Giant X play, I said, I have no clue how Juhan is doing in the ERL, but I would sub him in just based off of what Peach is showing. So in my mind, this change can only be positive. So the, the rumored roster now is Juhan, Jungle, you have Ignar, Support, Patrick AD, Jackie's mid lane, and then uh, finally the Antonio top. I think that, um, you know, it's uh, a roster that I don't think this will change them in the standing. Maybe, if anything, maybe this will put them lower in the standing. And maybe Casey is making the changes that will propel them above them, right? So there's that for Giant X. Next one in line is Vladi. So KCB lost yesterday against GK in a reverse sweep. Uh, there was uh, a lot of drama, uh, like very disappointing drama, I would say, where, you know, uh, there was um, so much flame towards Linkas. This was the first time KC ever lost at EMA Masters. You know, they, they've won every time they've attended. There's been cases where they didn't attend and didn't make playoffs and then somehow they moved into a summer split and, and, and popped off and uh, got shit done, like uh, last year with the addition of Kalist and so forth. But Linkas as a player, you know, 
just just for everybody out there to understand it's like vitality the coaching staff of vitality have had eyes on linkers for quite some time you know they they have been interested in this player they've wanted to work with this player for quite some time and this is something that Linkas enjoys. He wanted to nurture this. Uh, if you are working from an ERL system, right? If you're looking at what prospects you want to bring into the club, you need to make value assessments. Some players negotiate from a point of power. I know that uh, Linkas was a player that was talked about a lot. And for KCB to get him into the roster to win LFL and then go to EMA Masters because the result yesterday was very, very disappointing. With the layer that in the contract Linkas can exit and join a different organization, sometimes those are negotiations that happen. It's like if you want to attract, you know, top level talent to your ERL team, then sometimes these are concessions you need to make because you need to nurture every aspect of your team. If you look at the market in terms of, you know, where you want to, uh, you know, like what you want to achieve, Sometimes those are compromises that are right to make. I think it's fair from Linka's side to want to pursue something that is better for him. And also it is good business from Casey's side to actually set up the contract in the way that he has this option. Because maybe they wouldn't have signed him. And maybe if they didn't sign him, maybe they wouldn't have qualified uh, and, and, and won the LFL. Maybe the player that was next in line was so much weaker that the compromise was good to make. I think that Linka's did a good job in general at uh, the KC Club in, in KC Blue. And I think that, that every, every aspect of this in terms of Linkas' decision and the contract that uh, KC had him under, I think that's fair play. I think that's fair play. I think everyone acted well and, 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 and naturally. And the fact that Linkas is getting shit, is getting blamed for the BO5 loss and that he's a traitor, I hate this. I despise this. You should fight against this. This shouldn't be acceptable. And um, Link has made a decision that is best for him. And that is fair play. And he set himself up to have those options at the beginning of the season because he had leverage. And KC gave in to that leverage because they knew they need to make sure that their KCB roster is strong. So now the rest of the KCB roster were allowed to play with a strong jungle, which elevated players like Vladi, elevated players like Kalist. And I think that it's just a win-win situation all around, you know? And I think this is something that has missed out on. I think everything was managed in a good way when it comes to the business side, but the reaction is just poisonous, insanely poisonous. I guess we start here because Linkas is now going to Vitality. I think, you know, we scrimmed against Linkas. I think it's a player that is, that is decent. You know, the, the tricky thing always in terms of translating jungle performance from ERLs to then moving into LEC, it's like you play against demon junglers. I think jungle is probably like the strongest role in the LEC. I think that, um, you know, you get to play against Elioya, you get to play against Razor, Gyaik, and Yankos. You know, the, the list is, is, is long of demons. It's like Giant X just uh, put in a fucking... Uh, world champion. <laughs> uh, point being, I think knowing Vitality's coaching staff, you know, and them knowing Linkas, I think the main issue for Vitality is the fact that they're a team that has played without structure. They've managed to win situations due to how mechanically good they are, right? So, so the situations that the Vitality found themselves in many times were often really, really goofy lack of complete structure in the gameplay and that is something that could be tied to of course jungle not right now Andrew. please close the door um it can be tied to jungle so i think that this is something that can mend it you know douglas was picking up some steam was playing better and is going to get demoted to of course uh the um, erls but um you know i think that uh from an outside, it does seem that they are hoping that Linkas, together with Hilly, will be able to piece together that structure that this team is clearly lacking. So I'm excited for that development. Linkas is a very vocal player, and he can definitely be the piece that is missing. Because macro-wise, I think KCB had some good things in place. Uh, yesterday wasn't the best series, but it is what it is. I think this could be a step up for Vitality, and, and it could address their main issue. But... All of the toxicity surrounding his move, calling him a traitor, all this fucking shit, that's fucked up. Move away from this shit. If you're for some reason listening, 
you know, and, and, and you were one of the homies that hated on this, that's piss. And it's not fucking his fault that, you know, the everything got, got leaked. I don't know who's leaking this, you know. I don't know who's leaking this, whether it's agents or teams. You know, it's pathetic that it happens. Now I'm reading the leaks and I'm discussing them now because it's information that is in the open. But this just applied so much additional pressure on Linkas that wasn't uh, really necessary because the fact that the deal happened before EMEA Masters happened is a good thing for everybody involved. It gives Casey more time to prepare. And that's all you need. It's like, you, would you want him to play me Masters and then pull that decision and just leave KCB with a situation like Casey and KCB with a situation where they didn't have, t have any time to fix things? That would be BS. Now they've, uh, of course, signed closer, and that's a different conversation. But I think that, uh, you know, Linkas is a player that, uh, you know, doesn't deserve the flag that he's been getting. So the, the, the dilemma of, of Casey, of course, is that they had uh, two 10th place splits, horrible splits. Um, I think the main angle for Casey, of course, is to rebuild around Kalist. Kalist is the, the biggest asset that Casey has in terms of, you know, contracts. And I think that um, the main thing here for Summer is to use it as a kind of stepping stone for what's to come in the next year. I think this is the moment for you to build some experience, you know, build some experience for um, the people involved. And uh, I think that uh, to set the expectations that this team based over these changes is going to go to, you know, the World Championship or going to go far in summer is unrealistic because you need to keep in mind and keep track of the financial health. Like um, in this case, I'm sure that Casey got some money for selling Linkers. That could be beneficial. That can offset some of the, you know, losses in terms of some of the bench players and you know, in some cases bench coaches too, <laughs> to, to, to then build up a roster that can be a little bit more competitive and create a new dynamic because it's very obvious that the previous dynamic just doesn't work. So they're grabbing players that are available in the market in the, in, in the, in the, in the, in, in, in of course, closer. And, and, and Vlad is being moved up and Abedagio is going to be playing for, for KCB. You know, I think that's good all around. I think the main thing here, right, is that, you know, I think that Vladi is a player that has great potential and I hope that they don't drag him through summer to then judge him for it. Because, you know, the conversation of potential is always funny, right? I, I don't think necessarily that it's a question of, wow, we should let him play for fucking three years before he becomes good. It isn't a question of this. I think the adjustment period to get used to the Berlin life, to the LEC life, to the scrim schedules and, and, and taking in all this new stimuli, like you need to get adjusted to that properly and be given time to do so. But after that, you got to perform. You don't, you don't bring in a player because you think that he's going to improve rapidly, you bring in a player because he's showing characteristics that you want to replicate then in the main team. But in order to do so, the environment needs to be good for the player, right? And when I say environment, it needs to be like housing, you know, uh, Berlin food, you know, living, uh, living away from home, you know, all these things that every player needs to adjust to. Some players have it easier, some players have it harder. And um, after that adjustment period, using the summer as that, I think that Vladi together with Kalis could be like future prospects of core for next year. But obviously, I hope that if Vladi doesn't perform, that he doesn't get like dragged through the mud, you know, because I do think he shows good qualities in terms of uh, side lane understanding. I think his lane phase can improve, but this can be true for, for many people. His side lane understanding is very solid. It's at a very high level. And I think that he fights decently. I think this is a player that has potential, but I hope, you know, that potential doesn't get spoiled because he's not performing in week one of, of LEC Summer. I hope that people view uh, Casey's plan here through that lens. Summer is to set up for the next year. And in that next year, make sure that they have the right pieces around Kalist and maybe Bloody here and rock and roll. They are also moving on closer. You know, Bo is a player that, um, you know, I think Bo still has 
immaculate potential. He's one of the best players that I work with. I think that I shaped up a very good relationship with him. I think that we are moving in the right direction. In spring split, it really wasn't it. You know, I think it was not a good decision to, to remove me out of the situation because I think I kept a lot of things together that um, I think that KC underappreciated. But I think Bo as a player, it's very tough now because he went 10th, 10th, 10th in the last three splits. And there is, you know, some obvious fluctuations in performances. But I think this is a player that just needs to, you know, be given the right chance. You know, I think Bo as a player has unlimited potential. I think this is a player that can even go AD carry, by the way. I think he could play AD carry in Europe and dominate. And that's like something that people should entertain if they want to win. Because now Bo is at a point in time where he wants to just fucking play and demolish. And this is a very good opportunity for people to gain something, you know, uh, for teams to slot this play in for very cheap and rock and roll, you know. I think that is a great opportunity here. Okay. Closer. So the player that was busy, you know, he had a stint over in the LCS. He won the league with 100 Thieves. And then, you know, the last year that he played, it wasn't that great. But Closer comes with some experience and maybe, you know, uh, with uh, the addition of Closer, I don't think he's better than Bo individually. But maybe just the fresh into the dynamic and a little bit more, um, let's say, concrete uh, leadership. Uh, maybe this is going to make um, the games be a little bit more consistent. But I think that they have definitely lowered the ceiling of this team with the addition of Closer and the removal of Bo. I think that's something that everyone can understand. So uh, now we don't know what's happening with uh, top lane. I think Cabo had uh, like a good last split. Uh, the idea is Vladi, Closer, uh, Upset, Targamas, and then uh, I guess Cabo. I guess that's what's rumored. Uh, I think just the most important thing is that people should Look at what Casey is doing with the idea of how did they lead into the next year. Uh, because this is them trying to save budget and still trying to make things competitive and also setting up the players uh, for success. I just hope that Vladi gets uh, nurtured the right way. So I think that we, we covered it all. Uh, I, I think that's uh, pretty much it. I think um, you know it is uh, what it is. Uh, if I have missed anything, let me know. I'll catch you guys on the Flippity Flip. I wish you all the best and uh, look forward to my next videos. If you sneeze during this video, bless you and bless your face. Peace.